I just want you to treat your business like that big vision that you know it can be and not that lemonade stand. And this is, I'm not someone who says you need all the things all at once, but this is a great place to start. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one-stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Is your business legal? Now, I don't mean to scare you here. My question is really, have you thought about the legal considerations that come with starting a business? Permits and licenses, contracts and agreements, trademarks, copyrights, intellectual property and beyond. It's all a part of the entrepreneurial journey. And if there's any advice I want for you to take, it's this. Start your business on the right legal footing from day one. Lauren Boyd is an entrepreneur, an attorney, a podcast host, a speaker, and a proud mother-to-be who is dedicated to helping entrepreneurs gain confidence in their legal foundation. Lauren empowers entrepreneurs to build a strong foundation for their businesses through relationship-focused legal advice without relying on fear-based terms. Instead, Lauren comes from a place of empowerment and education. I'm excited to talk legal with Lauren today from the legal considerations to consider when starting a business, especially an online one, as well as other things to explore like trademarking and owning your brand. Here she is, Lauren Boyd. New year, new goals, new podcast recommendations. Because if I know anything about you, it's that you love to work with earbuds in, listening to business advice and entrepreneurial secrets from the best of the best. So let me introduce you to my pal, John Lee Dumas, host of the hugely popular Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast. Each weekday, John features an interview with entrepreneurs changing the game and digs into topics that are interesting as they are actionable. How to start your own business during a global pandemic. How business schools set founders up for failure. And the secrets to scaling a business are just a few of those conversations that he's having over on EO Fire. Listen to Entrepreneurs on Fire wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to Skillshare for supporting Gold Digger. Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. Do something today you couldn't do yesterday with classes designed for real life. Skillshare is an online learning community with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Gold Digger and get a one month free trial of premium membership. Well, first, I just want to welcome you, Lauren, to the Gold Digger podcast. Thank you for coming on the show today. I am so honored. As an avid listener, it's really nice to be here speaking with you. So I am so curious, where did your legal career begin and how did it evolve into what you do today? I love hearing origin stories. So share with me what yours is. So I really think it's important to say I had no clue I wanted to be a lawyer. And I say <laughs> and I say that because I feel like so many of us think that we look at everyone else and we assume and they had it all put together. They had this like grand plan. And though I'm like such a planner, I actually was in business school and undergrad and I have a finance and entrepreneurship degree. And I was like, I know I will own my own business, but I don't know what that is. And I was really inspired by, we had mock legal counsel from 30 year law students. And I was really inspired. And I said, you know what? I love that. I'm just going to go ahead and like throw my name in the hat. Like I'm going to apply and we'll see how this goes. And I applied, I got in and I just really stuck to my vision of wanting to get back into the business world to merge my kind of two passions now to merge the legal side of, you know, of an entrepreneurial business, but also, you know, hopefully get to the point that someday I would launch my own firm. I just didn't know when that day was going to be. So what was your path then for starting your own business? And like, how did you kind of merge those two passions together? 
Well, right after law school, I actually took a job. So usually there was, you know, for anyone who's like, there's kind of that traditional route of what you're supposed to do. I didn't listen to that. And instead I was like, you know, I really want to go work in-house. So I worked for, I did corporate law for several years, really enjoyed my experience, got to negotiate really large contracts, got to travel, kind of check the boxes. I was dating my now husband and I was like, you know, I have this crazy idea (laughs) that I should quit my very comfortable corporate job and start my own boutique law firm. And he was totally game. So obviously I married him because he's down for my crazy ideas. And I literally looked at at the calendar, picked a date and was like, okay, like I'm going to put my notice in and I'm going to kind of, I opened up my laptop and was like, how do people start a law firm? (laughs) I don't suggest to my clients do it the same way I did it, but I didn't have the ability to like start something on the side and kind of foster it and build it up over time. I was really this like clean cut, but you know, I, it was just something that like I knew was tugging on my heart and it was a matter of when I would do it, not if. And one of my friends said, you're just going to regret not doing it sooner. So I took the jump and that was actually three years ago now. And, you know, I just, I couldn't imagine my life any different. How has your business evolved from its beginning to now? What has the last three years looked like? And how have you kind of figured out what your niche is or where you show up best or how you serve the world in the best way? Oh, I love that question because I think a lot of, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves like, oh, we have to have it all figured out and it has to look this exact way. But my business has totally evolved since I launched. We now have a team, which is obviously, you know, is incredible. And even just the way we show up with our clients, I knew that the relationship side, the relationship that we build with our clients was probably the most important to me. And we've just always continued to look at how we could evolve and make that relationship stronger you know, through the systems that we've chose, through the way we speak, when we speak on, you know, Instagram or a newsletter or our blogs, like my podcast, whatever we're sharing information, we really try to keep it like approachable and we don't use fear tactics. And we give people some grace from realizing that they didn't, you know, they didn't know this before, but they know it now. And we've just kind of always approached our business with that mindset. How can we show up better to empower our clients and how can we show up better now? I have to think about, you know, how can I empower my team as well? And it just makes it so much more fun to kind of think about everybody in that way. And we've kind of just evolved from there. So we've had different pricing models. We've had, you know, different systems and we've just, you know, slowly made tweaks when we saw that there was something that wasn't serving us, we were willing to be flexible and make a change. So when we talk about legal topics on the show, I feel like people get really nervous. I'm sure you've experienced this in working with your clients, which is why you've kind of tailored your business and changed your strategy. So let's start at the beginning. Let's say somebody is listening. Maybe they have a side hustle. Maybe they have that dream, that idea like you had. And they're like, I want to start an actual business. Where do I begin Tell us where to start, Lauren. Okay. So the four things that I want you to start thinking about, and these are really, I like to say that these are mindset shifts. When you are fostering this new idea, this side hustle, taking the scary leap like I did and just like ripping off the bandaid, the four things that I would tell anyone that they need is to file an LLC. Of course, that's if you live in the States. So you would file a limited liability company. You can absolutely do it yourself. You do it with the either secretary of state's office or the corporation commission in your state. So you can really, it's like a quick Google search, look for a .gov website and file the business because that's going to create a separate entity from yourself And that is such a good liability piece. But again, all of these four things, I also think are the way you show up. It's giving you kind of that permission to say, I'm invested. I'm going to show up differently because I'm taking this seriously. So number one, file your LLC. 
And then at the same moment, right after you hit submit on filing your application, you can actually go and file a free EIN with the IRS. Again, look for the .gov website. Please do not get scammed by all the other ads that will pop up on Google telling you it's $99. You know all of the answers. You can absolutely file it yourself. You have to do it during business hours because the IRS knows how to make it just a little bit more complicated. So this won't be good for your late nights. But once you once you file your LLC, you can get a free EIN. You'll get it right away. Mm-hmm. And then you've got like these two big pieces. The EIN and the LLC together are going to allow you to form a business bank account. It's going to help you get like, you know, a business phone number. Like you're going to get all of these things like over time that you need because you've laid some of these foundations. Number three, business license. And know that we have different city and state rules. So Google both your business license and your state name, business license and your city, and see if there's something that comes up. Usually they're not very expensive, but it's just something you don't want to forget. And then last but not least, as you're thinking about your brand, make sure you're going to the USPTO.gov website doing a basic name search. And you're just going to be like throwing combinations, like my brand name, my new business name sounds like, and you're going to try different combinations and see if you get any direct hits, because I don't want you to launch a business on borrowed land. I want you to be Mm. able to make sure that you're going to own your brand over time. And that's the first step is doing some due diligence. It's not only about the Instagram handle or the domain name, take that extra step and do some due diligence on the uspto.gov website too. That is so powerful. And it's funny because looking back, I've made a lot of mistakes in my decade of entrepreneurship. But one of them was that I went on to LegalZoom and filed not as an LLC, but as a sole proprietor, mistake number one, (laughs) and had to go backwards and had to get things fixed with an accountant's help. But I look back and I remember sitting in an accountant's office before I'd even made a single penny saying, I need help. I want to do this right. Help me to set this up. And I think a lot of times we get so caught up in the details or in those decisions that we don't take action. And with legalities, I think a lot of people put that on the back burner and say, I'll get around to it later. So what if somebody's listening and they're like, I have a business, but it's not legit. Are there any special things they need to do or can they still follow those steps? I really think everybody should start there. And I kind of say that I don't want you to treat your business like the lemonade stands that we had when we were younger. I want you to show up powerfully, unapologetically in your business, whether it's your side hustle, it's going to be slow for you to scale. You haven't made any money. All of these things, once you start having business activity, all of these things are worthwhile to have. And they're low cost, they're DIY, which is why I feel like everyone should like put these these four things on your list and you're going to have that much more peace of mind. You're going to have an entity. You're going to start to see yourself as a business owner, you know, not someone who is like kind of starting this thing, right? Because we have to, (laughs) we have to like motivate ourselves and tell us that we're taking on this big, you know, this big, gosh, it's like a journey. And you know, if you're not willing to kind of invest in some of those steps, then, you know, I I think it's going to be a slower burn to get everything started. So starting there, super approachable. And, you know, I just want you to treat your business like that big vision that you know it can be and not that lemonade stand. And this is, I'm not someone who says you need all the things all at once, but this is a great place to start. So definitely these four things, they are so approachable for everybody. And if your business goes gangbusters and grows and you need to file a different tax, you know, as an S corp, it's actually just a a, a tax choice. It's not really actually changing your LLC. An accountant will help you with that when it's time. They will tell you when to do it. But these things, you know, I can't see anyone who doesn't need them. 
One of the things that you touched on was mindset shifts. A lot of legal stuff, really, as entrepreneurs, we have to get over the mindset and be in the right mindset to make these decisions and to really treat our business like it is legit. I'm curious, what are some of the misconceptions that entrepreneurs often have when it comes to legal needs of their business? Because your business literally speaks into those. So walk me through a few of those for any doubters that are listening. So... First off, legal does not have to be scary or unapproachable. Really, you know, the conversations that we have with our clients are often a lot about what their vision is, where they want to be this year, next year, where they're growing, and then what their boundaries are. Because we are huge. A lot of legal is really just setting clear expectations. So if you can think about where you want to be, and what boundaries you have, a lot of those things like, you know, forms of communication, office hours, you know, it sounds silly, but when I talk to our clients about like, so what are your office hours? They're like, well, usually I'll answer emails, but you know, it, and, and they're like, I'm like, no, but like, what would you like them to be? And they're like, I, I really didn't think that my lawyer would be asking me this, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I really want you to have your boundaries. Like, have you thought about you know, not having, you know, clients text you. Well, I would really love it, but they, they already do. And I'm like, well, we can, we can set that boundary. And for some people, I've had someone go, well, this feels like therapy. This doesn't feel like, you know, a, le- <laughs> a legal appointment because you can like, when you're setting expectations, you should be, you know, helping yourself grow to where you want to be. So one of the things that I think of when it comes to legal is there's a lot of question marks about what happens after you do those four steps, you know, we kind of check them off the list at the beginning of our journey. And then we get into new territory, things like trademarks and intellectual property. First, can we start with the question of does everyone need to trademark their brand name and assets? And what does a trademark actually protect? So a trademark essentially is going to protect anything that allows kind of the outside world, right? Customers to identify your brand. So they're going to say, you know, oh, I know this product or this service came from so-and-so because, you know, your, your brand name, your tagline, even your colors, those things are all elements that can be trademarked. It's different than copyright. Copyright is going to really protect a lot of your content and the value you're creating, the designs that you're making. That's going to be copyright. Trademark is your brand. I mean, think Starbucks, Nike Swish, all, all of those different elements that we're like, we see it, we know it, that is your brand. So when it comes to trademarking, Outside of anyone who has a more generic name, because you actually can't trademark anything generic. So for example, just trademarking your name, I would say is probably not necessary. Actually trademarking something that is so descriptive of what your product or service is, is going to also be very hard to trademark. What's good is when you have a unique, you know, a unique take on the products or service, a brand name that kind of speaks to either, you know, the kind of the attributes like the, you know, that gives people the feels you're, whether you have a name that is totally arbitrary, like for example, Apple for computers, that's a really good example of an arbitrary or fantasyful mark. Anything that's going to be that you're like, gosh, I don't want anyone else to use this and confuse my customers and think that that's me. That's where we're going to trademark. So if it's your first and last name, I'm not super worried. It's really, you can't actually just trademark someone's first and last name. You have to be showing that there's some, some reason, some distinctiveness to that. So let's just focus on the elements of your brand, your brand name, maybe your logo and your tagline. And you don't need all three, but like, let not all of us have all three. Give yourself the grace to say, you know what? I would be really unhappy if... And I would rather you do your brand name than anything else, because if you do your logo, there's a little kind of thing that people don't realize. They're like, oh, I want to trademark my logo. My logo, I don't know about anyone else. My logo has changed over the last three years. Mm -hmm. And so if you actually trademark your logo, it's only trademarked in the style. It's called a stylized mark. 
It's actually only trademarked in that same, like that same style, that fixed medium. So what I would rather you do is have a more distinctive name, put the effort into trademarking your brand name and protect that worst. We would actually file it as a word mark. And that's going to give you the permission to let your brand evolve over time. Hmm. I love that. As we look to the new year, you might be thinking about ways to hit the ground running with your business or even ways to help connect with your customers on a deeper level. We've talked about CRM platforms in the past, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about why they're essential for businesses in 2022. A CRM platform takes any customer interaction, like a sale from your website or clicking on your weekly newsletter, and it transforms that data into valuable insights. Insights like, when do my customers shop? And do my emails really get open more on a Monday? A HubSpot CRM platform is ready to help connect the dots between your business and your customers like never before. HubSpot is consistently working to make its products more connected than ever. With improved custom report builders, you can curate your data your way, making it super easy to review real-time reports on sales, marketing, deals, and more, all with just a few clicks. And if you're looking for cleaner data with a centralized system, the all-new Operations Hub Enterprise gives your team leads the ability to curate data sets for all users, meaning even faster and more consistent reporting. Learn more about how a HubSpot CRM platform can help connect your business in 2022 at HubSpot.com. We are just days away from a new year, and I know that I can't be alone in thinking about all the new things that I want to try and experience in 2022. With classes on Skillshare, it opens up so many opportunities to get creative and learn new skills taught by experts in their fields. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. At just $10 a month for an annual subscription, you could learn productivity for creatives with Thomas Frank or how to find your style with five exercises to unlock your creative identity taught by Andy J. Pizza and so many more incredible classes. If you're itching to get creative in the new year or just to experiment with some new skills, start exploring your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Gold Digger and get a free trial of premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash Gold Digger. Can you give a ballpark of what it costs to trademark something? And do you recommend DIYing this or is this something you want to hire a professional for? So you absolutely can file a trademark by yourself. However, what I like to tell people is kind of the good measuring stick is right now it's taking about five months for you to hear back from the USPTO. That's the US Patent and Trademark Office. It's taking five months. If you, you need to ask yourself, where will your brand be in five months? Because what I don't want you to do is to go in blind, file a trademark, because you're like, well, this is my name and here's my info. And you send your money in because they don't give refunds. You're going to just, it's going to be silent. And a lot of times the value in hiring an attorney in this space is going to be, they are going to do due diligence for you. They are going to do comprehensive trademark searches that are going to tell you all of the things that you should be aware of to make an informed decision and also help them and you prepare the most strategic application as possible so that when the five months rolls around, there's not any surprises. You got to anticipate those things that the USPTO were going to flag or signal, and you're not going to get bad news in five months and go, I was sitting here waiting. I already launched my brand. I've already invested all this money. I want you to just really think about where will I be in five months if I don't have all of the information Will this impact me? Or maybe you're like the perfect little side hustle right now. And you're like, I've got this idea. I'm just going to grow it real quietly, do some things. I'm not making any big investments. I wouldn't be sad if I had to change it. Then you can definitely do it DIY. Otherwise, I would absolutely hire a professional. Usually I find that it's about $2,000 in attorney's fees, but it's a year long process. They are a huge advocate for your business, for your vision. 
And I definitely think when it comes to your brand, we're always so willing to, you know, invest in pictures and branding and our website. This is really going to allow you to own your brand. And to be honest, it is such a wonderful revenue source that people don't even think about having ownership of these assets. It's just like any other asset. It is something that you can actually turn into a revenue source over time. So don't think of it as just like a pretty circle R and like this like fun stamp of approval. It has true value. So I went through the process of trademarking all of my course names, all different things. And yes, it is a very long process. I'm curious what you just said really piqued my interest in that this is an investment, but it is also something that can become earning potential. Walk me through what that looks like. Oh, I love this question. So I am a huge fan of of looking at what we have and finding a way to not reinvent the wheel. You know, often we're told to have, you know, more revenue streams and do more, but what if you could actually just take, you know, what you've already created and package up those rights and license them. So for example, if you have a trademark for a particular product, you can license the right for other people to sell it using your brand name. If you are a coach or somebody in the world that has like a method, right? Like a coaching method, you could actually enroll people in your vision. And instead of grow with employees and independent contractors, you can actually start to see your business as, you know, able to bring people in, train them, license the right for them to use your method, your brand name, your, you know, your trademark and say, you know, Hey, I proudly offer the, this, whatever it is, right. Method. And now it's another revenue stream for you. You're growing your vision and you're actually allowed, able to enroll people in your vision without having to kind of reinvent the wheel. Like, well, I'd really love to have another offering. So what new, what's new that I can create instead, how can I package up these rights and, you know, really allow other people to breathe some new life into my business. You can set parameters around it, which is great. It's kind of like a franchise. So look at a license, like think of all the franchises we know of, right? As a franchise for either a product-based business or a service-based business. And it's bundling up those rights and just saying, you know what? I have really worked hard to establish really goodwill and strong brand recognition that this, my brand is of true value. And so I'm going to actually be able to monetize it. I think that's such a great, great way for people to also see the value in doing something, going through the process like trademarking. Beyond trademarking, what are other legal actions that a brand or business can take to protect what they've created? I think a lot of times we don't turn to these legal things until we need them or it's too late (laughs) or we've recognized that we didn't do them in the first place. Walk me through other legal actions that can help protect us. Yes. So of course, you know, trademark infringement, that does give you the right to kind of shut people down and say, Hey, I already have this right. It's secured. But what often we see is actually a lot of copyright infringement. So that's going to be infringement on your designs or, you know, the materials that you're creating or, you know, the material inside your online course, the, you know, it sounds silly, your Instagram graphics or, you know, posts or some of those more design elements, anything that you are creating as that's an original work in a fixed medium. So that's, you know, your Instagram posts, your online course materials, all of that stuff falls into copyright. You automatically vest in having copyrights. Like you don't have to do anything fancy. You just automatically own the copyright to that material. Of course, you can register it. And the benefit of registering with the United States government is that it does kind of take away the, we'll call it like responsibility of you to prove that somebody knew that your work existed. Because basically you need to say like, they knew I existed and then they copied me. If you have a registered copyright, you kind of get to skip the like, they knew I existed because it's kind of in this national directory and it's called constructive notice. So just know that when you create something, you are automatically the owner of the copyright. When you have your employee create it or you pay somebody, 
of course, make sure that you read the contract, make sure you own the copyright, but you should, because it's called work made for hire. So I want you to own your copyrights. You own them because you created them or you paid for somebody to create them within the scope of their role or the services that they provided to you. So taking all of that effort, right? You've put a ton of effort into this wonderful Canva graphic and then someone just screenshots it and they throw it on Instagram. You actually have some really easy rights. It's You can do a copyright infringement form on their website and you actually can go on and just say, Hey, I created this here. Look, see, here's my original post and here's their post and Instagram and Etsy, any of those kind of big, you know, kind of social platform shopping platforms actually have these forms that are completely accessible DIY to, for example, type in Instagram copyright infringement or Etsy copyright infringement. And you can link the materials that they need to review and their teams are actually really, really responsive. So feel encouraged that you have some ability to kind of honor those and take some action. My favorite thing to do first though, is actually just to reach out to the person. If you can Mm -hmm. send them a note, don't assume that they know that they did something wrong. You might be like, well, they totally did something wrong. They completely copied me. But sometimes just like a nice message to them that says, hey, actually, I don't appreciate this. Can you please take it down is a really good place to start. We don't have to always jump down the road of like involving somebody else. And and I just think that's a good first step. So reach out to them, see if they'll take it down. Otherwise, take matters into your own hands, advocate for yourself and see what forms are available for you to have the copyright infringement flagged and removed by the site or platform itself. Mm, So powerful. I face this many times in my career. (laughs) uh, And I generally do start off with reaching out to someone. We actually did a whole episode on like what to do if somebody copies you. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where it happens. And a lot of times it's not, you know, to be intentionally destructive or any way like that. I know mm-hmm. in my early days, I wasn't the best at crediting or things like that. I didn't understand. Right. And so sometimes that educational opportunity can be what someone else needs to then pass that along to someone else. But yeah, it's good to have discernment around what is the value of what's happening here and where do you need to take it, which I think is powerful. Yeah, definitely advocate for yourself because if you don't, no one else is going to. And, you know, just remember we live in this world where like people are reposting and they're, you know, sharing your, your post on their stories. And I think it's just watered down in people's mind, what's okay and what's not okay. So uh, just kind of that loving nudge of like, Hey, I realize you did this, but like, you may not realize it. I would just really appreciate, like it goes a long way because we just live in this world where they may not have done it to be destructive. And if, you know, they stonewall you or they don't have a nice response back, then, you know, take that next step. But I think that's a perfect place to start. So what is your biggest piece of advice in the legal space for entrepreneurs, both seasoned and first timers? Ooh, I feel like we kind of covered this already, but my favorite thing is to remind people that your business is going to evolve and allow yourself room for your business to evolve, your goals, your boundaries, and look at some of your kind of more basic foundational elements. So that's why I don't love actually filing a logo for you as opposed to a word mark. I want your foundation to be something that can be kind of this living, breathing, evolving piece. So what I would say is, you know, for example, if you have a service contract, don't forget every once in a while, like sometimes we like, we get it all ready and then we start using it and then we don't go back to it. Just like anything else, anything else in your process, pull it out every once in a while, dust it off and read through it. Do I, you know, is that currently how we do things? Is that still my boundary? Is that how I want people to communicate with me? Is that really the best payment method or, you know, timeline of, of, you know, payment due dates? Is that best for us? Pull it out every once in a while and just take a look at it. Treat it like a living document. When you learn a lesson from maybe a difficult client, Pull it out and ask yourself, mm-hmm. where could I have informed them in our, you know, our email? I'm a huge like canned email person. Like I love a good workflow. Like mm-hmm. where could I have reminded them of this ahead of time? 
where can I in my contract echo to prevent this from happening again? So, you know, seasoned entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs, just know your business is going to evolve and remind yourself, put it on the calendar, pull out your contract, go through your processes, make sure that you're kind of the baseline, the rules, the, you know, the expectations, that's really what a contract is. A lot of expectations are clear and they are aligned with your business as you evolve. Mm, I love that. That is so, so powerful. So before we wrap up, as we approach a new year, what are you excited about, Lauren? Like what is firing you up? What is your vision for this upcoming year? I want to hear it all. Ugh, well, I am honestly so excited because we're entering a really fun season. You know, I think the holidays with our baby are going to be so much fun. So we're happy to have our sweet girl around the house. But when it comes to kind of the business, I think I'm in this stage that I really want to honor the fact that we're in a new season of life. And so I'm looking at how my team approaches things, how I approach things in our business to make sure that, you know, we're set to continue to scale and serve our clients well, but also, you know, take some of the pressure off because I think, you know, a lot of things I preach is finding ways to not reinvent the wheel or work so hard or use great systems. And, you know, I just want to keep us going on that process, you know, focus on empowering our clients, empowering my team and, you know, making sure that, I have more more time to kind of spend at home and being present. That was really why I launched my business was for this eventual day that's now mm-hmm. come. So I'm really ready to kind of lean into what this new season has in store for us, even though I don't think we kind of haven't figured out yet. I don't think you ever figured out. <laughs> <laughs> that's so exciting. Lauren, where can everybody find out more about you, learn more from you, check in on your business, follow your family, give me all the places. So honestly, the best place is on Instagram at the Lauren Boyd. And, you know, of course we share some really cute baby pictures and some family updates, but we try to just break down the things we chatted about here. We just break them down and we try to make it really accessible. So check us out there. We have a contract template shop for anyone in the kind of DIY stage of their business or that needs a resource right now on the laurenboyd.com. And if you are interested in, you know, trademarking your business, learning more about what that can look like, you can listen to our podcast. We've got some really great episodes on that on the Lauren Boyd show. And if you need our team support, we are absolutely here for you. My law firm's name is Guide My Business. And my team is so in love with happy, you know, talking with new people, you know, getting to see a slice of what you're doing and what you're up to. So we are so happy to kind of support and kind of walk along entrepreneurs during this crazy journey that we're in. Lauren, thank you so much for coming on, giving us this legal boot camp (laughs) and for sharing just so much insightful knowledge that will help take this scary out of the legality so that we can all be too legit to quit. So thank you for (laughs) being here with me today. I so appreciate you. I am so honored. Thank you so much for having me today, Jenna. I'm not going to lie. There are a lot of scary, unknown aspects to entrepreneurship. But I love Lauren's approach because she really believes and the way that she shows up and serves shows you that legal doesn't have to be scary. In fact, it can invite you to really step in and own your role, to invest in your idea, your business, your side hustle enough to make it legit. And I can tell you that that is a feeling that you wouldn't trade for the world. So I sincerely hope that today's episode felt like a mini course on how to make your business legal. If you're listening and you're like, shoot, I never did that. Those four steps that Lauren shared at the beginning are the perfect place to begin. Anyone can do those. And if you're looking at this new year as the year that you really launch your business, now you have the right foundation to make sure that your business is legal and legit. I am so excited that you tuned into this episode of Gold Digger Podcast. Thank you so much for being a part of the community and the movement. And of course, until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. 
I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 